Hi, I'm Chris Katolka, host of the Friends of Israel Today radio program and the editorial writer for Israel My Glory magazine. Now, we've got a great interview for you today. We're going to be looking at our most recent issue of Israel My Glory, which is all about King David. And we've got Steve Conover, who's the executive vice president of the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry and also the vice president of media for our organization, talking about his article in our Israel My Glory magazine called The Sweet Psalmist of Israel. Speaking of King David, uh, Steve's going to share his thoughts about all of the amazing things that David did throughout his life and how these expressions are found of his love for the Lord all throughout the Psalms that I think are going to connect with you as a believer. Well, Steve, I have known you for a really long time. We do radio together, and I know that whenever we talk about developing radio programs, um, we sit down and we have our team meetings. Sometimes the topic of the Psalms comes up, and it's something that definitely, I can always see it on your face that you get excited about. Uh, um, uh, explaining the Psalms, teaching the Psalms, engaging with the Psalms. And I, I'm just interested, That it seems like something that's near and dear to you. Why, why do you love the Psalms so much? I think partly because they're music, and they're just the expression of our faith. And mm -hmm. you see formal Psalms, you see these Psalms of um, adoration and thanksgiving, you see the Songs of Ascent and you also see the not only the royal psalms, but you see these very raw psalms with the lament psalms and even the imprecatory psalms where you're asking God to serve justice. Uh, so I think it's just the gamut of human emotion that you see in the psalms. It's so fascinating. I, I never thought about that with you because you are a musician. And so it, it makes sense now. The psalms, like you said, they are music. And that's something that's really special to think, you know, you're, we read the lyrics normally from David or from the psalmists, but they were designed to be sung, which is something special. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Steve, in your article, it's called The Sweetest uh, Psalmist of Israel. Uh, you say about half of the 150 psalms in the Bible are attributed to David, and his heartfelt expressions are as varied as his life experiences. So, Steve, David's life experiences range from shepherd to king. How did all that play into the way that you wrote, uh, wrote uh, you know, this article with the Psalms to the Lord? Yeah, I think just like we see in the types of Psalms, we just see so much variety in David's life. We see him as the shepherd. We see him as a warrior. We see him as a refugee. Uh, we see him as a king. So just the types of psalms and then his expression with coming from being a musician himself. Uh, we know from the Bible that he was a great mus musician and uh, that he was a shepherd all the way to being a king. He just had such a diverse life. And then we know that he was anointed by God. Uh, we see in the end of his life that he talks about being the anointed one and that the Spirit had touched his tongue. Mm -hmm. uh, so just so fascinating to look into his life, and I think it gives us so much insight into how we can express our adoration, uh, the really difficult things we face in life, how we're supposed to pray. I think there's a lot to teach us there. You know, I, I like what you say about David. Is It's like he used both sides of his brain to serve the Lord. Um, you know, he was a warrior king, like you said. It actually is the idea that he was a military strategist in the Hebrew like so he used that strategic side of of the side of his brain but then he also had that creative element to him as well where he desired to pour his heart out to the Lord in in song and prayer he was a talented uh, um, a liar player and that's King Saul said I need somebody to soothe this yeah. uh, this spiritual issue that I'm dealing with and they called David in to play the liar he was a talented he used both sides of, sides of his brain to, to worship God which I just think is amazing um, and speaking of both sides you divide the Psalms up through various expressions uh, that you mention. Uh, the first one is this expression that you can see of safety, which comes from Psalm 3. Uh, how does the story of David's trust in God in, in the face of daunting odds inspire you in your daily life, especially considering his belief that salvation belongs to the Lord, as it was mentioned in the Psalms? Psalm 3 is one of those lament psalms, and here he is, his own son, wants to usurp 
his kingship and he's on the run. Uh, he has lost the people. The people are with Absalom. They, he stole their hearts, the Bible says. And so he could have a lot of self-doubt. He could be really uh, just scared for his physical safety. So he's dealing with all those things. But what we learn from that is we see what he does. He goes to God. He just brings it all out there. He tells us the source of his sorrow, and he does it in such a raw way. He's not sugarcoating anything when he talks to God in a a lament psalm. Um, He's saying that I can sleep at night, though, because I trust in you, God. He said, uh, although I'm surrounded by my enemies, it's it's up to you whether I wake up the next day or not. It's just, uh, just a great testimony of how he was open with God and how he trusted God. And I think that's something that's lost for a lot of us today. I think when we think of the lament psalms as Christians, we often think of that, well, that's just complaining. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more to it because it's getting to the source of our sorrow. Uh, That's what we see in the lament psalms, but it's not left there. We see that it's, it's coming to the Lord and saying, This is the reality. I am scared. This is bad. It's really bad right now. However, it doesn't end there. He goes to reminding God of his promises. And then after he reminds God of his promises, he says, I can trust you. So even in the midst of all this, I can still trust you because you are a perfect, sovereign God and uh, my shepherd and, you know, my king. You know, I, I love what you're saying here because it's the idea, like you said, of God's faithfulness. David was counting on God's faithfulness so that even in those moments of suffering, even in those moments of pain, even in those moments of being being felt as though he was abandoned, mm. um, he was able to always pivot those lament psalms away from that moment of suffering or pain and, and relying on the Lord for his faithfulness. And that is something that David does so well as, as he pours his heart out. And it's a testimony, at least for me, too, when I read the Psalms, to think, Lord, this is a, a moment where I, I know I'm suffering, uh, there's anguish, maybe depression, whatever, that in those moments I can turn to the Lord and be confidently reminded of his faithfulness no matter what. Amen. Um, Steve, I, I want to turn to a psalm that I'm sure everybody is familiar with, because I feel like it's a psalm that could have been written yesterday, Psalm 51, mm-hmm. a psalm of God's mercy and David's brokenness. Can you share how this psalm uh, 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 and how God's mercy is manifested in our brokenness when we turn to him? What a psalm, what a place in life he was. And here he is, he had adultery, an adulterous affair with Bathsheba. Then he murders her husband, and of course he's confronted by Nathan the prophet. And what's so fascinating about this is we know he is a man after God's own heart, and I think we get insight into this because maybe the worst moment of his life as far as failure, he doesn't explain it away. He doesn't make excuses. He he realizes that uh, if there's a sacrifice I could make, I'd bring it to you. Mm-hmm. I can't. Only you can make me clean. Mm-hmm. So he's transparent about his sin, uh, how the the depths of the sin, and he asks that, Lord, you can make me clean. So I think it's the humility he shows that we can learn so much from, because it's hard to imagine. I mean, there's murder in there. Mm-hmm. There's adultery in there. It's about, it's about as bad as you can get. And when he's confronted, he just faced it. And again, we see that he was increasing his dependence on God and decreasing his dependence on himself and what he could see. You know, you and I, we co-host the Friends of Israel Today radio program together, and we've, we've talked about Psalm 51 quite a bit. And the one thing that always strikes me about that psalm, too, in relationship to the article that you wrote, is that David in his brokenness fell on God's mercy, like what you're talking about. Mm. But it was the fact that David read God's word, because I always think it's amazing in the very beginning of Psalm 51, David actually quotes God from Exodus chapter 34, and he's almost saying, I know who you are because you tell me that you're a merciful, gracious, long-suffering, patient God who's forgiving. And so in knowing who God's character and nature is, David is able to, in his brokenness, 
uh, beg and plead to God asking for forgiveness, knowing that only forgiveness can be found in him. And I just think that's amazing that in the Psalms, a lot of the Psalms are built on understanding God's word already. They were all, David was already a long time ago reading the Torah. He was reading the law, and he knew who God was, and he knew he had sinned great, but God was able to forgive him because he knew who God was. Yeah. That's an amazing thing to think about when you, when you couple God's mercy with, with your brokenness, that you can be confident in who, the, who God is, his character and nature. Mm. Uh, Steve, King David had an unwavering belief in provision in his life. Uh, as you illustrate in Psalm 23 in the article, the provision was multifaceted. It was, it was a provision of peace, it was a provision of guidance, physical and spiritual provisions, as well as freedom. I love this, freedom from fear. Mm. How does God's provision for King David change the way that you think about your own life? Yeah, to think that David was a shepherd and he calls God his shepherd. David knew what it took to shepherd sheep. He knew that he needed to keep them safe. They needed water. They needed food. All that it took to keep a sheep alive and safe, David understood that, and here he understood, I need a shepherd, that uh, I would be wayward if I didn't have uh, a shepherd of my own. And here he calls the sovereign God of the universe his shepherd, mm. which is just really incredible. I think the way it plays out in my life practically is when I think about how I pray uh, and it's very easy for me, and maybe some people can relate to this, where my prayers uh, are a little too sticky, like I'm putting it at God's feet, but it comes back with me, and now I'm thinking about it. Maybe I'm problem solving. Maybe I'm worrying about it. Maybe I'm not sleeping, and I'm just thinking about this. And I'm not actually praying. I'm not actually trusting. And that kind of goes back to what we learn about lament, that, yes, bring that request or that concern to God, but then remind him of who he is and what he's promised me, and then trust him. And that's where we get back to that other psalm in Psalm 3 where he could sleep at night because he knew who he trusted. So I think that's the practical way I think about that psalm. That's a, that's a really good thought, too, uh, especially as we pivot now to Psalm 18. Uh, you know, David always seems to be in need of rescuing. Yeah. Whenever you read the Psalms, you're always like, this guy's always in trouble, King David. Uh, but when, when when you stop and think about your own life, uh, I always need rescuing. That's the way, you know, I started thinking about it as I was developing uh, these questions and, and uh, reading your article. Um, physical rescuing. I need physical rescuing. I need spiritual rescuing. In your article, you use a better word, deliverance. Mm. How should a Christian understand God's desire to deliver us as David was delivered from his enemies over the years? Yeah, so in this psalm, it's the king himself who is after David. And David calls on God, so he, he calls God his rock, he calls him his fortress. So the king and his army is after him. So you think of what David's feeling is in that moment. He needed a rock, he needed a fortress, and he says that it was God that pulled him from the depths. Uh, so he's rescued from drowning in his own probably concern and fear and sorrow. And here God places him on a rock that's higher than him. He, he makes his feet like the deer's feet. So uh, I think the, the way I think about that is that what we see in that psalm is that when our hope is in God and not in what we see, that he can lift us up out of that range of emotions that can trouble us. And what's interesting in that psalm is that he tells God how great he is. Uh, and just to see how he bursts into praise after he thinks about his situation, he says, God, you're my rock and my refuge. And then he just adores God. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful psalm. You know, we only have a few moments left, Steve, but one, what's one last word that you want to leave uh, for our listeners and those who are watching on the sweet psalmist of Israel, King David? I would say that the one thing I've been discovering uh, in the research of this article the most is uh, twofold. The first part is related to that last psalm where uh, we see 
David said that uh, you take care of me, the anointed, meaning David, but you are also taking care of my descendants. So his hope wasn't just for himself. It was that he would fulfill the promises to the nation. So I think here at the Friends of Israel, that's kind of a big picture, uh, beautiful answer to prayer that David, even back then, saw and said, yeah, I trust God not just for today, for me. I know he's going to keep his promises to Israel. And then I think, making it personal, I really think it has a lot to say. Studying David in the Psalms have a lot to say about our sanctification, you know, if you want to call it spiritual formation, how our faith is formed, how the rubber meets the road, where uh, I'm becoming more like Christ. So I think when we look at David's life and we see it through the the uh, historical books and then his expression in the Psalms, we can start to put together that those things in our lives that concern us, we can come to him and we can say, this is the situation. It's pretty rough. Mm -hmm. I'm actually frightened by it. Uh, I have no answers for it. However, I know you've, you keep your promises. I know you love me, Lord, and therefore I trust you. And then not make that prayer sticky now, you know, actually leave it at his feet. And then I can say, Lord, I trust you. And then put my head on the pillow, hopefully, and, you know, have a good night's sleep because we trust one that is trustworthy.